It's I not us. Religions. It's not us. Belligerent BTW. <laughs> Look, get that out of my face. Get it out of my face. Get it out of my face. Now, sir, you're with the news media network, and you understand what touching the camera does. Are you with the and I know what I'm... Network? No one me. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you. As always, we appreciate you watching. Hope you're ready for another study from God's Word. Uh, was glad to see uh, uh, the phone calls coming in to uh, have a talk with Mark. That was a very good lesson. A lot of people are calling in, asking about... Uh, uh, the questions that he had, I think a lot of people wanted the the reward. I'm not sure exactly what that was, but uh, you know, whenever you, it, it's it's really kind of sad that you had to bribe people to to call in and examine the Bible. But if that's what it takes, we're glad to do that. And I know that you got to see some truth as a result of that. Uh, a gentleman called in, uh, called me on the phone. He couldn't get in uh, to Mark, and uh, he came out of the Methodist Church. I believe he came out of the Methodist Church. Uh, talked with him today, and he said, you know, he just wanted everybody to know that the Methodist Church did not start uh, in in the Bible. It had its beginnings with Charles Wesley and John Wesley. They they began the Methodist Church, <clears throat> and uh, it's you know, it's a uh, seventeen hundred years removed from the beginning of the of the uh, uh, the Lord's Church. So in no way, shape, or form is the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Lutheran Church, whatever, uh, they're not related to the Church that you read out in the Bible at all. But the church that you do read about in the Bible, the kind of church that you read about in the Bible, the people who are striving to follow the same pattern that will produce the church you read about in the Bible, <clears throat> meet at 250 the Boulevard there in Eden. If you are interested in, in the truth, studying the truth, then we hope that you will come out and be, be with us. 250 the Boulevard uh, there in Eden. You can call me at 276-340-2653. Or 336-394-5721 is where you can, you can reach me. That's another phone that you can reach me at if you don't get the first one. But uh, if you'd like to email me, wordfromthelord at gmail.com, uh, A-W-F-T-L-D-B-D, if you'd like to copy the programs. These are things that we give away free of charge, of course, and hope that you will avail yourself of that. Uh, H-23 Starting Avenue is where another group of Christians who follow the Bible meet. If you're in the Martinsville area, uh, they'd be glad to visit with you. 120 American Legion in Danville, <clears throat> where Mark is preaching, and I know that those brethren over there would be glad to study the Bible with you as well. Uh, these programs that you see, friends, uh, of what does the Bible say in the Word of the Lord, these are programs that are brought to you by people who believe so much in what we, uh, uh, what we believe. We believe in it so fervently that we allow ourselves really to uh, uh, be examined, be scrutinized, whether it be on TV or where we are, we are, are willing to uh, ask questions, be asked questions, to be asked questions in order to help you see the truth. And that's really why we do what we do. What does the Bible say uh, on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m.? Brother John Robertson uh, is uh, uh, broadcasting down there on Tuesday night as well. WHIGTV.com. Uh, find the link and you can uh, watch that online as well uh, for those of you up in this area. So uh, we appreciate uh, those who are encouraging us, realizing that uh, what we're doing is, is spreading the gospel and people who recognize that what we're telling them is the truth. They've come out of denominations. They've come out of the churches of men and uh, they're seeking the truth and we hope that we can help you uh, in any way, shape or form. We will be glad to do that very thing. You know, friends, one of the things that that we uh, try to emphasize quite often is the idea of, of uh, why we do what we do. And what we're doing is we're basically showing you that we understand authority and we use authority. Now, you know, someone who has authority is very confident that they can do something and not be harmed. Sometimes people usurp authority. They go beyond the authority, the power that's given them, because they are overconfident that they will not be held accountable. We say they are above the law. They think that they're above the law. But a person who is using authority in the way that they should 
really has a unique position because they not only are willing to submit to the authority, but they are willing to do what the authority says and also be confident that they are doing what they are authorized to do. Now, when people don't understand authority, you find that they are going to be one or two things. Either they are going to go beyond what is authorized, be above the law, or they are going to be more reserved and not do what they're supposed to do. So they're going to be timid. They're going to be reserved. Either they're going to be timid and reserved or they're going to be uh, 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 blatantly uh, unconcerned about what is authorized. But when we're talking about the Bible, friends, we are confident that we are authorized to speak what we speak and thus we're using the authority that's been given us. That's why we have confidence. Notice what Paul said in, in 2 Timothy 3 verse 14. He says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, friends, stop and think for a moment. If you had been taught by the Apostle Paul, do you think maybe that you would have more confidence in what you had been taught and what you had believed and what you are, 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 are following than maybe what you do now? I mean, just stop and think about it. You, you, you probably go to worship. You go to uh, assembly on, on the first day of the week. Uh, most of you. Some of you probably go on Saturday. But you listen to a man and you have some confidence because that man is educated or he has studied the Bible or he has, uh, he's in a position of authority and you look up to him and you, you say, you know what, I'm confident he's telling me the truth. I hear that all, 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 all the time. People say, well, my preacher preaches the Bible. Well, if you really have confidence and you really understand that he is telling you the truth, then you should have no problem then being just as confident and regurgitating what he's teaching you. That's what Paul's saying. Timothy, Timothy, you should have confidence. You can continue the things that you've learned to me and been, might have been made sure of, knowing of whom you've taught them. Listen, if the apostle Paul had taught me the Bible, I guarantee you that there would be no doubt in my mind I would be even more confident that what we're having is the truth than I have today. But the reason why I have the same confidence is because I'm doing exactly what Paul said I'm authorized to do. So Paul is giving authorization through this word, and that is what gives us assurance. Now, friends, sometimes people say that we're, we're cocky. Sometimes they say, well, y'all are just boastful. Y'all are just bragging. No, friends, that's coming from understanding authority. That's because that's we're using authority in the right way. Now, if you are using God's word as your authority, you ought to have the same confidence. Now, look at Peter and John in Acts 4 and verse 13. In Acts 4 and verse 13 says, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, the crowd that is listening to Peter and John, remember they have already called them uh, into question about the healing of this lame man who had been lame for 40 years, uh, over 40 years from, from birth. And they said, by whose authority did you do this? By whose authority did you heal this man? That's Acts chapter 4. That's Acts 4 and verse uh, 7. They said, by whose authority, by what power, or by what name have you done this? And so they're asking them about authority. They're saying, whose authority is this? And they said, well, Jesus. You know, he's the one that's given us, gave us authority to do this. So when they're looking at Peter and John, they're recognizing these guys are not educated. They are not like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They're not like Gamaliel, a doctor of the law here. These are ignorant and unlearned men, but yet they have boldness in what they're preaching. Now, friends, I submit to you, that the reason why Peter and John were bold is because they had confidence about who had given them the authority to do what they did. See? Now, if, if, you, have a, if you have a permit from the city to march down the street and protest, you are going to be even more bolder and you're going to be uh, more confident 
that what you're uh, in your calls because now you've been given permission. Now, if you haven't been given a permit, maybe you're doing something that you're not real sure if you're going to get in trouble for or not, you're going to be a little more timid because you know that, you know what, I may not be authorized to do this or I may not be confident that this is the right thing to do or that this is the right approach. And so confidence comes from understanding that you have some authority here. Now, notice this. In Acts 4 and verse 29, Acts 4 and verse 29, we're going to see that the disciples and the apostles, they're actually going to uh, pray for even more boldness. Acts 4 verse 29 They said, Now, Lord, and Lord, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants with all boldness they may speak thy word. Uh, come down to verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, three times in chapter 4, you see that term boldness, or that word boldness. And there's a reason why they were bold, friends, is because they understood who was backing them, who was telling them and giving them the authorization to do what they're doing. Let's look at this word boldness. Because as was said earlier, sometimes people think that we're cocky, that we're arrogant, but friends, that's really not the case. What we are is we are just confident and we are bold because we understand the Bible and we understand how it authorizes. That's what gives us our boldness. That word boldness means outspokenness. It means frankness. It means bluntness. It is the freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech, confidence. Friends, do you realize why some people march, march into Washington and hold protest? It's because the Constitution of the United States grants the freedom of speech. That's the first, that's the first uh, uh, amendment in the Bill of Rights, the freedom of speech. And that's why people are confident because they say, look, it is our right. We, ha we have unreservedness in speech. We are confident because we know we have the authority to, to protest. We have the authority to write our senators and write our congressmen and tell them that we don't agree with what they're doing. We have the right to, to talk about our uh, 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 representatives. We have the right to, to disagree. We have the right to protest the president and, and the rulings of courts and what have you. Why? Because it is a right. We have the authority to do that. And we understand too, friends, that when someone wants to take away a right, they're basically trying to take away the authority that we have been given to do certain things. That's why people are upset about the, the Second Amendment. Take, trying, people trying to take it away. Look, I have the right to bear arms. I have the right to, uh, uh, to, to have a gun, to own a gun, to carry a gun. I have that right. And so that is my authority. And so when you understand authority, when you understand what, uh, what it gives you and you use it correctly, friends, you, there should be no uh, 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 timidness about us. We ought to say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to be blunt. I'm going to be forthright with it all. Now, friends, when it comes to religion, if you have authority to do something, why are you so timid? See, there was no need for the apostles to be timid because they knew who was authorizing them to speak what they spake. They, they knew who was, who was authorizing them. As a matter of fact, in, uh, in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, when uh, they're questioned about why they're, why they're doing what they're doing, uh, you know, here, here they're saying, you know, we are, we can't help but speak the things that, that we, we, we've been uh, told. Uh, verse, not, verse 19, Peter and John answered and said, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge ye, but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We have confidence. Now, someone says, well, what gives them confidence? Well, they were confident, number one, because of what Jesus had told them the authorization that Jesus had given them to go out and be bold, to be unreserved, not to worry about things. Notice this. In Luke 21, 14 through 15, this is what Jesus says. He says, Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. All right? 
Jesus said, don't worry about it. I'm going to give it to you. You, you won't have to worry about what you're going to answer because it's going to be given. You're going to put it in your mouth. Matthew 10, 19 through 20, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what you shall speak, for it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So you don't have to worry about it, he says. Now, friends, I say that would be very nice today if we had that same direct power to not have to worry about studying, not have to worry about giving an answer, and it's just going to be given to us. But that's not the case. We understand miracles, miracles were to uh, uh, give us the word, to preserve the word for us, and then it's our job, our responsibility today, to study it, to write and divide it, 2 Timothy 2.15, and uh, uh, to give an answer based upon what we've uh, 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 studied. So, but still, the authority is still the same, friends. If we know that we're authorized by the word of God, then we should be, we should be just as bold because the boldness of Peter and John was uh, directly associated with the person who gave them the authority. That it was, it was associated with Jesus. Now, friends, when people say, y'all, you know, y'all, y'all mean, y'all are rude, y'all are loud, obnoxious, whatever they want to say about us, and they've said us all, some things that we can't even repeat on TV, we've, uh, uh, we, we've heard it all. But, friends, it all comes because we're confident. You know why we have the statement, you know why we say a $1,000 reward for anybody that can find a different kind of church in the Bible than the, than the church of Christ? You know, if you can find the Baptist Church of the Bible, there's a thousand dollars. You know why we can offer that? Because we understand the authority. We know what the Bible says. To that, you know why we're not afraid to invite uh, denominational preachers to come on to sit with us and give them half of our time and let them espouse the doctrines that they teach. You know why we're not worried about that? Because we understand the authority. And Peter and John understood where they got their authority. They understood who was authorizing them, and the result was they were bold. And that was directly associated with Christ. Friends, now notice this. In John 7, 26, the people, the people who were listening to Peter and John, they heard Jesus too. And notice, notice the, the similarities here. In John 7, 26, but lo, this is what they're saying about Jesus, but lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? See, the people were saying, you know what? The rulers must know this is the Christ because he is speaking boldly and they're not saying anything about him. He has more authority than they do because they don't ask him any questions. They know he'll trip them up. So they understood who had the authority here. John eleven fourteen. 14, Jesus said unto them, plainly, Lazarus is dead. Here's that word boldly. Now, friends, when you tell someone boldly or when you tell someone plainly, you make it so clear that they can't misunderstand it. Now, friends, we've been given a lot of flack because we try to tell people plainly. With, without beating around the bush, we try to tell them plainly what the Bible says. We try to give them a very plain and clear answer from the Bible and so that they don't misunderstand what the Bible is saying. Now, friends, let me tell you this. There's a lot of people who think that they are in the church you read about in the Bible. There's a lot of people who are in churches of men who will tell you, yeah, I'm a member of the church of Christ, but we're just all different bodies, in, we're all different members of the same body. They think that all the denominations are, are members of the body of Christ. But friends, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the authority says. And someone with confidence comes along and says, Friends, the church of Christ, the church that Christ said he would build, Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I will build my church. The church that Jesus said he was going to build, all right, is only one kind of church. It is his body, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, all right? Uh, the, the church that Christ said he would build is his, is his body. Ephesians 1, 22. God has put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. 
So the church that Christ built is his body, and there's only one body, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 4. There's one body, and that body, the church, is what Jesus is going to save. All right? He's the Savior of the body. Well, if the church is the body, he's the Savior of the church. Now, friends, this is where we get accused of being mean, rude, whatever. But when we are telling you plainly, that is, we're trying to make it so you don't misunderstand it, we may have to tell you something like this. The church of the Bible is only one kind of church, one kind of church. It is not, it is not the Methodist church. It is not the Lutheran church. It is not the Baptist church. It is not the Pentecostal church. It is not the Catholic church. It is not the whatever church. Because it's not mentioned in the Bible. Now, friends, if I just said there's one church in the Bible and it's the church of Christ, you understood that. But too many people misunderstand it because they think that they're part of the church of Christ because they know that they want to be a part of the church that you read about in the Bible. But, friends, when you understand authority, you can boldly say and you can confidently say and you can plainly say, friends, there's only one kind of church in the Bible. It's the church of Christ. And the Baptist, the Methodist, and all these churches of men are not part of it. Now, when we say that plainly, so that you don't misunderstand what we're saying, that's when people come and say, well, y'all are just mean, y'all are hateful, y'all are just telling everybody you're going to hell. Friends, I could tell you that if you are not in the body of Christ, Christ will not save you. Ephesians Ephesians 5, 23, he's the savior of the body. And if you're not in that body, he's not going to save you. Now, you're smart enough to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. You can put 2 and 2 together and realize that if Jesus is going to save one body and you're not in that body, then you're going to be lost. Now, I didn't tell you you're going to hell. You put that together based upon what you reasoned from the authority, the authorized word. Now, if someone comes up and plainly asks me, just tells me point blank, tell me, am I going to be, am I going to go to heaven? Or am I going to go to hell if I stay in a church that is started by a man and not the church that Christ built? Am I going to go to heaven or hell? Now, friends, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to say? Am I going to say, am I supposed to say, well, friend, you're going to go to heaven because you're in something that Christ said he's not going to say. Well, I can't say that. I can't say that you're going to heaven. But then if I say, well, friend, you would go to hell if you're not in the church that you read out in the Bible. If I say that, boy, the minute I say that, boy, it's all, you know, all the knives come out. People want to gnash on us with their teeth. Oh, you just told me I'm going to hell. Well, friend, did you really want to know the truth? If you really wanted to know the answer, you know, that's why you ask. If you didn't want to know the answer, then don't ask me. But friends, when we understand what the Bible teaches, we can't help but be plain. We can't help but be bold and confident when you understand beyond a shadow of doubt what the Bible's teaching. Jesus was bold. Jesus was plain. In John 18, verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in a temple where the Jews always resort and in secret have I said nothing. Friends, here's what, here's what confidence does for you. Here's what understanding uh, what, author, what is authorized, this is what it will do for you. It will allow you to speak openly. It will allow you to speak plainly. It will allow you to split, speak beyond a shadow of a doubt. This is truth. Now, some people are going to say that they're going to talk bad about it. Some people are going to say, well, you're, you're mean or whatever. Well, friends, it's not going to stop me. People can say bad things about us all we want to because we are so bold, because we are so plain. But the bottom line is we're bold and plain because that's where our Lord was. Our Lord understands that he got his words from God, from the Father. And he gave those words to the apostles. John 17, John 17, uh, let's just look at this. Jesus got his words from, uh, from the Father. Uh, 
he says, verse 13, he says, uh, and now come out to thee with these things speaking the uh, they think speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Excuse me. Now, friends, think about this. Jesus said people are going to hate his disciples because of the word that God gave him. Now, if I tell you plainly what the Bible says, if I tell you with confidence what the Bible says, if I tell you forthright, if I tell you with unreservedness of speech, if I tell you boldly what the Bible says, if you don't love the truth, you're going to hate me too. But that's not going to stop me from being confident. That's not going to stop me from being bold. Now, people can call us names and say bad things about us all they want to, but friends, we understand the authority. Christ received his words from the Father. He gave them to the apostles, and the apostles gave them to us. So why should we then be timid and reserved about speaking the words of God? Do you deny or do you say this is not the word of God? If it's the word of God and you know it's the word of God, why don't you be confident in speaking it? If you know that what you believe is in the word of God, why don't you be bold and just spit it out? Listen, it didn't stop Paul. It didn't stop Paul. If you have confidence knowing where you got the message, you ought to boldly say it. Now look at this. In Acts 28, verse 30 and 31, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. Now he was in jail. He was in a hired house and received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no man forbidding him. I often wonder why people are so timid when it comes to preaching the Word of God. Listen, Paul was bold, he was confident because he knew where he got the message. All right? He knew where he got the message. In Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. You know what he says? He says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, when you are confident that the message is from God, when you're confident that it is the infallible truth, when you're confident that what you're teaching is in total agreement with what is authorized, friends, you'll be confident. You'll be bold. You shouldn't be timid. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. Notice this in Galatians and first and second Corinthians three and verse twelve. He says, Seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. The same word as confidence, same word as boldness. We use great plainness of speech. Second Corinthians four, seven, verse four. He said, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. Paul was bold in his speech. He was, he was, he was uh, confident because he knew that this was indeed the word of God. And he knew that what he was preaching was from the mouth of God. He knew that what he was preaching came from the mind of God and from the mouth of God. And thus, he was not going to be intimidated. He was not going to back down from preaching it. Friends, this is what I teach uh, little kids whenever they're talking about the Bible. Paul said this, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished with all good works. That word is inspiration it means God breathed. I tell, the, I tell the children so they easily remember, it came from the mouth of God came from God's mouth. Now, friends, if you, are, if you really believe this, if you believe that all scriptures are given by inspiration of God, then when you preach 
and you are confident that what you're preaching is from the Word of God, you ought to preach with confidence. You shouldn't have any qualms, any troubles saying what you believe, being questioned about what you believe. Because after all, you're confident, right? Look what Paul said in Ephesians 6, verse 19. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul said, I'm confident. I know what the mystery is. I'm confident in it. But pray that I may open my mouth boldly. See, you ought to be confident, friends. Open your mouth boldly. If what you really, if what you really have is really from the Bible, if it's really you ought you ought to be speaking it every day, loud and loud and proud. But you know, some people are timid. Some people are afraid of what they of what they believe. This is what I don't understand. Friends, if you have authority from Christ to do what you do, if you have authority from the Bible, from the Word of God, to practice what you practice, to teach what you teach, to preach what you preach, why cower and hide? If it is the case that for example, and I didn't hear the whole conversation, but I know a guy called in on Mark's program, and, I, and, and apparently he claimed to have the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, if that was the case, if the Holy Spirit today operated in the same way it did in the first century, and people had this direct revelation of the Holy Spirit, they could speak in tongues and discern spirits and so forth, why, why don't you have confidence in that. Why don't you demonstrate it? Why don't you prove to everyone that we are the false teachers, we're the naysayers, when we say no, that's not the case. If you are so confident, if you're so confident that you have the truth, friends, why is it when you're questioned that you decide, you know what, no, I'm, I'm not going to answer that. I, I'm not going to uh, go down that road. Why, why is that? Why don't you uh, have the same confidence that they had in the first century? If in fact, if in fact you uh, uh, are, are speaking the word of God. I mean, confidence comes from knowing what you believe. It comes from knowing what you believe. All right, so if you, if you believe it, if you have confidence that you can back it up, then why not, for the good of everybody, for the community, just come out and demonstrate it? You know, there's a lot of preachers, when you ask them a question, they'll tell you, no, you know, I, I'm not going to answer that. I, I'm, I'm just not going to, to talk to you about that. Why, why is that? Why is that? Why is it that preachers don't come on TV with us? Why is it that preachers run and hide? Why is it preachers won't answer the door? Why is it preachers won't sit down and have a Bible study? Why is it the members will say that, but the preachers won't? Here's an example. Here's an example. If, if someone truly believed and had confidence that what they're believing is from the Bible, they should say, you know what? No doubt about it, we will answer questions. This is a lady uh, that's being asked a question. She's from uh, the Eden Baptist Church, right, right down the street from where we meet. Daryl Law is the preacher. And this was a question that was asked of her. Phone call? You're on the word of the Lord. Yeah, I got a question for you. Okay. Uh, can you show me in the Bible where you've got the authority to use mechanical uh, instruments such as television or computer or anything to 
spread the gospel. Can you show me that in the Bible? I sure can. I can show you where I have authority to spread the gospel. Matthew 28. On the TV. With the TV. Okay. Jesus With said... the TV. G all right, let me answer your question. Jesus said, Go therefore, teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, the command was to go. Did Jesus say how to go? Uh, when you when you rejoice to the Lord and, and did, sing. Did Jesus say how to go? Say, so you're not answering, you sir, sir, you asked me a question. You asked me a question, and I'm trying to help you see the answer. Did Jesus tell them how to go? Did he tell them how to go? Yeah, he just said go. Did he tell them how? Did he tell them ride a mule? Did he tell them walk? Did he tell them take a plane, take a bus? They, they, they knew how to go in that uh, century, in that first century okay. or whatever no, century Well, let me ask you this. If a preacher, century. if a preacher, That's why we use music to uh, to praise the Lord and to sir, uh, see. Here's the problem: you don't understand authority. Now I'm going to answer this question, and I'm going to ask you another one. Here's the thing: they they had modes of going that we don't have today. Now, does that mean that when we go and preach the gospel, that we have to go only the way they went, walking? or riding a, an animal, or maybe on boats. That's where Paul went. Th those are about the only ways that I can recall that they went, driving a chariot, Acts chapter 8. Now, are, are when we go and spread the gospel, are we limited to those methods of going? Well, of course, the answer is no. You know, if a man gets on a plane and flies overseas to preach the gospel, that's fine. He's not violating the command to go. So when we preach the gospel and we're using means to spread the gospel into all the world, TV, internet, computers, we're not changing the gospel, sir. We're not, we're not adding to the command. We're simply using the means necessary to get the, to get the word out better. Now, you want to compare this. You want, to compare, you want to compare this to instrumental music, don't you? That's, where, that's what you want to go, do, isn't it? Sure, sure. Okay. Now, sure. yeah. now listen to what listen to what God says, and let's see if let's see if it compares here. Matt, uh, Ephesians chapter five and verse nineteen. Now God says, "Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord." Now. If you add something to that, are you doing what God said? You're adding something to something when you fly to go. No, fly how am I to adding to the gospel? gospel? You're adding a jet. How are you adding? How, a how is a jet adding jet to the back. gospel? There wasn't a jet back then. So you're saying that we can only go spread the gospel the same way they went to spread the gospel. No, I'm saying you go on that jet, and I'm saying this is the 21st century, and you make you make a joy from the Lord unto the Lord, and you sir, use you can use the instruments that's sir, joyful. You don't, you don't understand how God authorizes. God's telling us here specifically what He wants. He wants singing. Yeah, you guys make yourself look like idiots on there. I mean, I agree with the Bible, but you really y'all are fanatical idiots, is what you make yourself out to be. Now, sir, on. now, sir, you're the one telling us. You're the one telling us that. Flying on a jet to, spread, to preach the gospel is the same as putting a piano or mechanical instruments of music in worship. Now, and you really want to call us an idiot? Did they, did they have pianos and guitars and, uh, that, and organs back then when they sang? No, they didn't. They were invented later. Are you sure, sir? Now, wait a minute. The church to fellowship and to praise the Lord and make his oil for oil to the Lord. Now, sir, are, now, when do you say mechanical instruments of music were... Invented? Okay. Well, the Internet wasn't invented. I mean, no, no, then, that's my question. You know, now you said, we're using the Internet. You said they the didn't have television. television music. You know, you're, you're, you're not listening to me on that. I'm, I'm listening to you. But I'm try But you're moving on to another to another uh, 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 subject here. Now, look at this. You said they didn't have mechanical instruments of music back then. Well, this is Genesis. I believe that's a... That's... That's probably before Acts, wasn't it? Genesis, 
Genesis chapter 4 and verse 21. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled the harp and the organ. So if God had wanted mechanical instruments of music, if he wanted a harp and an organ, they would have been around and available to use in worship. But you know what God said? God said, I want singing. And when you add the harp or the organ or anything else to it, you're adding to what God says. But going with the message is not limited to how I go. I can fly. I can walk. I can ride a bike. I can take a, a car. I can take a boat. I can take a train. That, I'm not limited to how I can go, but I am limited on what I can preach because that's what the command is telling us to do, preach the gospel. Now, if I add something to the gospel, just can't, now I've can't changed listen. what God says. You just, can't listen. you just can't listen to mechanical music when you're on the way to spread the gospel. Is that right? I, I, you can't worship God with mechanical instrument music because that's not what God wanted. Well, you tell God, call me up. My number, you know my number. Just have him call me after you finish talking to him and uh, let me know what he's telling you. He can tell me what he's telling you. Who's that? Thank you. What's that? I, I, I missed that, sir. Call you up? I, I, I don't understand what he's talking about there. But friends, now you see how, how silly this is? The comparison of instrumental music to modes of transportation See, the command to go does not dictate how to go. But the command to sing is limited only to sing. If you want to compare the two commands of, of, of singing and uh, preaching the gospel, then you have to compare preaching and singing, not singing and going. See, God says go and preach the gospel. Now, if I add to the preaching of the gospel, let's say I preach the gospel and I preach Baptist doctrine. That is the same thing as singing and playing. Because singing and playing is adding something accompanying to the play, uh, singing and preaching the gospel and Baptist doctrine is adding something to the gospel. See? Now, the reason why we're so confident, friends, is because I understand that gentlemen like this call in and the best argument they have is something silly like this and the result is, well, we're called idiots. Well, that's fine. The reason why that doesn't bother me is because I'm confident that I can answer these questions and I'm not worried about what someone says coming around and, uh, uh, you know, biting me. Somewhere else. Tripping me up somewhere else. I'm not worried about that. All right? Now, listen to what this lady from, Eden, from the Eden Baptist Church says. And, Scotty, we may have to work on the, on the volume on this. I'm not sure how, how good it's going to come through. But if we have to play it again, we will. Got a quick question for you. Which, I don't know, this is a question about a question. Uh, I know I had one of the members there at the Eden Baptist Church said that uh, that they don't allow questions to be asked. Is that, I mean, do they really do that? If you have that? a question on what he's preaching on, like on Wednesday night, mm -hmm. it's more or less open. Um, if you have a question on what he's preaching on, mm -hmm. or if you don't understand something, he'll explain it. Oh, okay. Well, this guy... Uh, as far as comparing us to what other churches, we don't do that right, in the middle right. of the service. Okay. I know this guy, he says just no questions at all. He was just, you know, yeah. that was um, the guy who works for Dita Walker's son. Dan. 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 I can't think of that. Oh, has he? So, yeah, he was going to read school badges. Oh, okay. And he joined it. Well, it's been a few months now. Oh, okay. I know he said no questions at all, and I was like, really? They don't like no questions? No questions at all. Don't come in here asking no questions. I'm like, okay. All right. Well, I just I just wanted to, oh, to no, ask him. If you, if you don't understand something he's preaching about. No, we don't do it on Sunday or Sunday mm -hmm. night sometimes it's more. Well, I was, I was meaning like more like a Bible study type of setting, you know, like that. Okay. 
But he had rather you ask a question about it than to go away misled. Right. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, but he had rather you ask a question about it than to go away misled. You know. But he had rather you ask a question about it than to go away misled. You know. But he had rather you ask a question about it than to go away misled. You know. All right. Now, we ask about asking questions, and the lady says, she said, oh, no, no, we'll answer questions. And the preacher would rather you ask questions than to go away being misled. Now, that's admirable. That We, we like that, appreciate that. Now, a little bit um, about that same time, uh, I don't know what the, what the time frame on this, maybe one of these guys can help me. What's the time frame on that question and this flyer? The day before or the day after? Okay, but so about a week's different. We, um, uh, a fellow was door knocking. This is from the Eden Baptist Church advertising a, friends and fam a family and friends day, March 3rd. And a gentleman was walking around. He was handing out these flyers. And uh, Mark was actually talking to the man that was handing out the flyer and was asked about questions. He said, well, you can come. You can come, but, you know, uh, no questions. Or did he tell you y'all could have questions on that day? He said he had to ask the pastor. He had to ask the preacher, the pastor, if, if we could come and ask questions. Now, the lady said, oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. You, you can ask questions. Now, here is what the man who was door knocking, who was door knocking and decided that when we were having a Bible discussion there on the lawn, for some reason he just he decided he was done with that and he was gone. Run like a rabbit. Alright? He was done with it. Now he calls, he calls, and this is what he says about coming and asking questions. Now this is the one where you're gonna have trouble hearing him. Okay, huh? All right, go ahead. Okay, I talked with my pastor, and he will not be allowed to ask questions. Oh, okay. Just wanted to make that clear. He's welcome to come, but you know, need to uh, be respectful and all that sort of service. Okay, and what what church was that again? That was Eden Baptist Church. Okay. All right, so don't no asking questions. Okay. Now you're not able to ask questions. Well, boy, I got you on the phone. Are you doing okay? You okay. Okay, so, huh? All right, go ahead. No, no questions. No questions. Eden Baptist Church, no questions. Now, call the pastor. The pastor said, you can come and be respectful. Say nothing, I guess is what that means, but no questions. Now, friends, I have to wonder why is it that they don't want any questions. The, the member, the church member, thought that, yeah, it would be fine to come and ask questions. The, this other gentleman says, no questions. Preacher says, no questions. Now, I have been down to the Eden Baptist Church on a Wednesday night before. After being invited, we were knocking doors, and the lady said, well, won't y'all come to my church, is what she said. I said, well, where do, you, where do you go to church? She said, right over here. She pointed to where it was, told us where it was, and I said, okay, we might do it. So we went down that Wednesday night. And the preacher, Mr. Law, he said, we're not having Bible class tonight. We're just having prayer meeting. I said, well, we wanted to come and ask some questions. He said, well, we're not having Bible study tonight. I said, what about next week? He said, well, I don't know. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Now, friends, did he just not want to answer questions? Was he afraid that what he was teaching might be tripped up? Did he not have confidence in what he was preaching? See, friends, I submit to you that if you know what you believe and you're confident as from the Bible, then you ought to be uh, boldly proclaiming it as the truth. That's what we're doing. See, that's why, that's why we'll stand up here and we'll take phone calls because we are confident that what we're teaching is the truth. Now, folks, the friends of the Eden Baptist Church the preacher says, no questions. We'll invite you to come, but no questions. Now, here's what I find interesting. We went to another Baptist church, and we sat respectfully in the back, 
didn't make a peep until after the service when we asked a question and we were told that we should stand up and participate. It's almost like if we if we go and we participate, then we'll be told we're rebel rousers. And if we go and sit respectfully, you know, now we're, then we're condemned for doing that too. So which is it? How about you folks just get your doctrine and get your authority from the Bible and you can have the same confidence that we have? You know what? I'm waiting, Mark. I, I would like for someone with the same confidence who believes so firmly in what they teach and what they believe, I'm waiting for them to invite us to come on their TV time. I'm waiting for one of them to say, you know what? You folks, you folks are, uh, are teaching error, and I'm confident that I have the truth. I want to invite you and split the time with you all and answer you. Give you a chance to talk, and then, you, then, uh, then I'll answer it. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. You know why? I think because they're not confident. Is this the first one for me? You're on the word from the Lord. You're on the word from the Lord. Hello, James. Yes. This is Troy in East Texas. How you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good lesson, man. Good lesson. You know, people trivialize the things that we teach from the Bible and the New Testament and understanding the proper authority, and we're so far removed from when God struck people dead for disobedience that we just don't respect the Word of God. Many of us don't respect the Word of God, and so therefore we just we can add things to the Lord's Supper. It really doesn't matter. We can add things to the worship because that's what we like, and we forget God yeah. is the audience, not yeah. us. God is the audience. We worship Him. If our minds went back to Le Leviticus chapter, chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, these people... And in verses 1 through 3 of Leviticus chapter 10, all they done wrong, what I understand is, they got fire, but it was from the wrong location. Right. Just simply the wrong That's right. location. That's right. Now, when, when, when the Lord gets down to that serious, we better go back and wonder and think and study why that happened. Because when we read Romans 15, 4 and 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that tells us that all those lessons we learn in the Old Testament, we better understand. Right. We better right. learn them and study them because right. it's our responsibility to know how God acts towards those that disobey Him. That's right. That's a good point. And, you know, like the gentleman said earlier that called in and was talking about mechanical instruments music. Now, would he, would he take it upon himself to add to the Lord's Supper? You know, I think he would understand, you know, no, that would be adding too. You couldn't add to the Lord's Supper. You couldn't add something because that's not authorized. But yet he wants to do uh -huh. the same thing with the singing part that he more than likely wouldn't do for the Lord's Supper part. Now, I don't know. I can't put words in his mouth. He, he may want to be calling back. There's another call in line. He may be calling back saying he would add to it. I don't know. But, but uh, yeah, giving God what he wants, what he authorizes, that's the only way to know for sure that you are, can have confidence in that you're not going beyond what he says are not doing less than what he says. And it just takes knowing his word. I appreciate your call. Appreciate your call. I got another phone. I'm going to take this, try to get this last call in. All right. All right. Thanks for calling. You want to work from the Lord? Yes. Uh, I have a question. The, the Church of Christ, do you all believe in speaking in tongues? And can you explain the church at Antioch and the uh, day of Pentecost and whatever. Okay. Uh, the, do, you, do you believe in speaking in tongues? I believe in. The, I believe they did in the first century for the purpose of confirming the word. In other words, let me let me show you this in Mark chapter sixteen and verse sixteen when Jesus gives the gives the commission to go and you know preach the gospel. Uh, then it says, "These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall." Uh, in my name shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, and, and, and uh, take up serpents and drink any deadly thing that shall not hurt them, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, this is why they were able to do all those things. Look at verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. So in the first century, in the church at Antioch, for example, 
uh, or uh, you said Antioch the, and uh, the day of Pentecost. Yes. The the New Testament was not written. So when Paul or Peter or the other disciples, apostles came in, they couldn't say, here's what the, what the Bible says, because the New Testament wasn't written. So they were giving, they were revealing the word uh, through letters and through uh, verbal speech, through words and, and epistles, what Paul would say. And so until this word was all written down and confirmed, finally delivered, Jude 3, they needed some way to verify that what was being said was indeed the word of God. Now, how would they do that? If someone today came in and said, here's what God says, you and I would probably say, well, show us in the Bible because we believe this is the word of God, right? You uh, you but, believe that people uh, speak in tongues today, or it's only no, back sir. in no? That's what I'm getting to. They spoke in tongues only to confirm the word. Today I'm, we I'm, have the confirmed word, so we don't need speaking in tongues. I'm speaking of today. There are people speaking tongues. Do you you all don't agree with this? Or what tongues are they? Well, I like the maybe Pentecostal church or. Uh, the Pentecostal church doesn't speak in a language like they did in the first century. In the first century, they were speaking in unlearned tongues. In other words, tongues that they hadn't studied to learn, they were simply speaking it. Just like if you've never studied Spanish and all of a sudden you start speaking Spanish, that would be a miracle. But today, you need something like Rosetta Stone or something to teach you Spanish in order to learn that language. But we're talking about uh, we're not talking about gibberish. We're talking about languages wherein people are born. Actually, this, this, this is indicate when the Spirit gave utterance, they spoke in other tongues. It wasn't something they made up. The way I know, I but it was, it was a language. It, look, it was a language. Acts 2, verse 6. What do you mean, like uh, if they were from Ethiopia or from another place? Exactly right. Exactly right, right here. In Acts, Acts 2, verse 8, here's all the people that were in Jerusalem, and they all heard them speak in their own tongues, wherein they were born. Acts 2, 5 through uh, 12. Just re read that. Sir, I'm out of time. I realize it's 10 o'clock. Yeah. It's, it's 10 o'clock. I've got to go. They're going to cut me off and then go to the news. So I appreciate your call. Uh, well, that, that's a good, that's good uh, call, folks. Friends, the reason why we preach, because we're confident that it's from the Bible. You can have the same confidence if you just go to the Bible and find what you believe in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, don't have confidence in it. See, that's why we preach it. We're going to boldly proclaim it because that's what the word from the Lord is. Friends, thanks for watching. If we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Till next time, remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you'll always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night.